I think it is clear to believe in the power of ideas. Fresh, thank you for the Manhattan Institute. My name is uh, Steve Malanga. I'm a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute and a senior editor of City Journal. And, um, you know, I have to admit, uh, I live in New Jersey. Uh, see, every time I say that, people laugh. Not so much as they used to, but they still laugh. But uh, <laughs> that's it. What exit? Uh, 15W. Um, <laughs> but despite the fact that I live in New Jersey, in the springtime, when the national media were all talking about the possibility that our governor might run for president, I found myself wishing that the man who would declare was Mitch Daniels. Now, <laughs> that's, that's not because I don't admire what Governor Christie is doing, but I took Governor Christie at his word when he said he was new to the national stage and new to a lot of national issues. And also, I understood that uh, it's going to take a long time to fix New Jersey. <clears throat> but, you know, listening to the governor, I got thinking, well, who among the governors was experienced on the national stage already? And who had a track record of uh, fixing his state already? You know, that's the kind of thinking that led me to uh, Governor Daniels. Now, first of all, it's worth noting that he spent a good amount of his career in the private sector as a senior executive, including as a CEO of uh, Eli Lilly's North American Operations. These days, job creators are in short supply everywhere in our economy, but especially in Washington. And having been one is certainly the beginning of a good political resume, in my opinion. Governor Daniels also understands the federal government as well as just about anyone, which also is no small virtue these days, because, of course, he served as director of the, of the Office of Management and Budget under uh, President Bush. Since 2005, however, he's been at the task of boldly ministering to the budget of Indiana, now, long before the financial bubble burst in 2008 and taxpayers swept in a wave of reformed governors, Governor Daniels was taking daring action to fortify his home state because he saw the unsustainable trends there. Shortly after taking office and without much fanfare, he narrowed public sector union bargaining rights in order to pave the way for a restructuring of the state's government because he wanted to make it more effect efficient. Among his innovations was instituting health savings accounts for government employees, including himself, to give workers greater incentive to take more control of decisions about their own health care. Today, some 70% of government workers in the state have signed up for HSAs in Indiana, compared to just 2% of government workers nationwide. That's because elsewhere, public employee unions have stridently resisted consumer-directed accounts. But in Indiana, research has shown that those who use HSAs are much more careful about the health care they use, saving themselves and their employer, in this case the state, significant amounts of money. <clears throat> Later, Governor Daniels extended this philosophy of consumer-directed health care to the state's Medicaid program, giving recipients, recipients of government-subsidized health care the same control over their decisions. Now, Governor Daniels has also brought some refreshingly old-fashioned common sense to governor, governing. When a study found that the state was spending 34 cents to collect every 15 cent toll on the Indiana Tollway, the governor observed that we'd be better off using the honor system. Now, instead of using the honor system or merely raising tolls, what he did was lease the tollway to a private operator, took the money from the deal, and used it to replenish the state's depleted transportation infrastructure fund. Now, all of this has paid off for Governor Daniels. He eliminated a $600, $700 million deficit early in his tenure, back when times were good for just about everybody else. Those of you who are old enough will remember when times were good. Uh, and his cost cuttings and efficiencies have placed the state's budget on solid ground. In fact, in fiscal 2012, Indiana was one of only eight states that essentially didn't have to face a budget deficit. But don't take my word for his accomplishments. Today, the Manhattan Institute has released the results of a series of national and local polls about state government. And 77% of Indiana residents 
said they believe their state government is run efficiently. An astounding result in an age of tax revolt, voter discontent, and cynicism about government. Now, for those of you who haven't been following the news, uh, I have to tell you that Governor Daniels has decided not to run for president. But he did instead decide to share his vision for how to fix some of this country's most pressing problems in his new book, Keeping the Republic, Saving America by Trusting Americans, which is being released today. Uh, he's already boldly gone where few governors have gone before, and he'd like to see the, less, the rest of the country follow. So please join me in welcoming to New York Governor Mitch Daniels. Thank you, Stephen. Stephen and Michael, the Institute and all its uh, supporters. Uh, it's a, a, a moment I've looked forward to. I've, uh, I feel a, an obligation uh, that I'm, I'm finally getting a chance to discharge. Some, one of the greats, Frank Meyer or somebody once said that he saw public service as part of the rent he owed this country. I think I owe the Manhattan Institute some rent. I've been reading and consuming and learning from your products, the work of people like Stephen, for a long time. And it's about time I came around and tried to do something uh, small by way, of, uh, by way of compensation. I'm told by uh, one of uh, Michael's uh, um, very able uh, colleagues, Lindsey Craig, that this, uh, she says that uh, this uh, program is being streamed over the web. I said, Lindsey, who? is gonna to wanna to watch me give a talk at this hour. She said, oh no, a lot of people do. She said, a lot of them are doing, or will be watching at work. <laughs> she said, you know, you could speak to them. So I wanna do that. If there are any Indiana State employees watching this program right now, shut it off the computer. Okay. I'm uh, aware and I want to commend the Institute for the uh, principal topic on which I understand you're gathered today, the discussion about the, the uh, condition, the, the, the problems, the equities involved in the rise of public sector unionism and uh, what it means for uh, taxpayers, what it means for government. And so I want to spend a few moments uh, uh, at the beginning of, the, of, of this uh, exchange uh, shaping my comments to that is certainly something I treat heavily in this, uh, this little work I've, that we've just released today. Uh, but then uh, the most important part will be the question period, which Michael's going to help with, and I'll get us there as fast as I can. Let me uh, start by telling you a story. In 2008, uh, shortly after the uh, nominations for uh, uh, state offices happened in Indiana in May, uh, we woke up to the startling news that the Service Employees International Union had made the largest contribution by far in the history of our state to my newly nominated opponent. About a million dollars, one check. And then accompanied with a statement that said, there's more where that came from. And statements like, we'll do what it takes. This was interesting because they had no employees in our state or no members in our state. Maybe a few in a casino up north, somebody thought, but really essentially zero to show such a sudden and, and huge interest. So uh, a uh, typical citizen would uh, have been, uh, I'm sure many of them did uh, react, and uh, as one of my daughters would have said, what's up with that? Well, any, any uh, attentive reader of Stephen's work or other uh, recent journalism on this subject would have figured it out pretty quickly. They were trying to buy a governor. And um, if they had, uh, despite that very, very large contribution and whatever else might have, flowed, uh, might have followed it, there, the ROI on that investment would have been immediate and very large. Because, um, plainly, um, their candidate would have, by executive order, reinstated a uh, collective bargaining agreement, so-called, for the um, then 36,000 employees of the state of Indiana, begun collecting um, 
whether the employee liked it or not. 1.82% of pay um, every paid period. And millions and millions of dollars would have flown in every year. That had, that had been um, the, uh, the case before we got there. The, the preface to this story, we spoiled the party, by the way. We won the election. And, and, um, and that particular investment didn't come to much. But you can do the arithmetic, and uh, pretty good. You can bet on a few states, and if one comes in, you're a winner in a formula like that. Um, on my first day on the job, we did, a, we did a number of things. We had run, and this is back in 2005, we had campaigned as openly and, and forthrightly as I knew how, very specific program, a big change in a state that hadn't, has never been known for change and hadn't seen any in a long time before our arrival. And um, among the actions we took on the first day, and there were many, there was one that I almost uh, uh, chose not to take. And that was to strike down that original, now then 16-year-old executive order, uh, conferring what were called collective bargaining rights on state employees. I've admitted many times, I thought long and hard about not doing it, or, or postponing it at least, or doing it in some partial way. Why would I be so craven, you're asking yourself? And the answer was that, um, in my mind's eye, I saw what Scott Walker faced in Wisconsin uh, just a few months ago. And I saw the possibility that this whole host of other changes, which we were so um, imbued with um, a passion for, to put our state uh, then flat broke on sound fiscal grounds again, to to begin making change after change after change that would make us more growth and job and investment friendly, um, to a, a sweeping rewrite of all the ethics laws of the state on and on and on, it might all be in jeopardy because of some massive outpouring, some protests, some uh, walkouts, whatever, whatever it might have led to. But after thinking a lot longer than I usually do about a decision, and um, arguing my, with myself for the better part of a couple, three months, I finally had I listened to enough people. I became convinced we could not make the kind of changes in state government that we were determined to make. Um, shackled to 160 pages of thou shalt and thou shalt nots. It's, I should mention to you that these agreements for which the employees were paying dues every week um, did not give them the right to bargain over benefits or wages. Ordinarily, the heart of a collective bargaining agreement. But what they did do was uh, commit the, the state government uh, to paralysis, as I saw it. I mean, you couldn't, I usually say you couldn't, you know, move a chair from one side of the room to the other without a 30, 60 day, six month negotiation. So, Having thought this over, uh, I did strike it down, pulled up the cover, <laughs> and hoped for the best. And what happened was nothing, except over the first about eight months, 90 plus percent of the employees quit paying the dues. Interesting little plebiscite. And we went to work reforming and transforming Indiana state government, which will be the principal message I want to uh, deliver to you um, in this part of the program. Um, so it was another one of those examples of, of act when you act early, act decisively, and, and uh, I'm awfully glad that I did it. There's a, there's a uh, favorite country and western song of mine that says, uh, titled, uh, If I'd Shot You When I Should Have, I'd Be Out of Jail By Now. <laughs> So I'm awfully glad we pulled the trigger on this one. It was absolutely the right thing. Now let me make a point that I think is, is central. Uh, yes, we saved a lot of money. These arguments tend to, 
to start, but they sometimes stop with this, you know, how much the current system's costing and what you might save. And, and I know in many, many cases that is job one, especially if you're in, um, in very serious f fiscal shape as many states are. Yes, we did. Uh, we uh, consolidated all sorts of functions across state governments, you know, HR and IT and personnel. We um, contracted out for all sorts of things that um, uh, the private sector could do better and, more, and, and uh, less expensively, or at least thought they could. I always said, if you can find it in the yellow pages, uh, maybe we shouldn't be doing it ourselves. And, you know, we, we turned seven separate print shops. I just always remember this when our folks found seven different agencies with print shops on the same corridor. Go in one and they're working overtime, get the tax forms or something printed. Go in the next two and they're playing cards because they have nothing to do. Um, Yes, we were able, it was, it was a part, it was a significant part of moving our state from the red to the black. But it has never been to me the single rationale or even the biggest one. What it really enabled us to do was make government work more effectively in a thousand ways we never could have otherwise. On that same first day, for instance, pursuant to a, an, a, a passion I had developed only learned about as a no-name, first-time candidate banging around our state day after day after day for 16 months. I had learned and that we had probably the worst system in America for protecting vulnerable children, those at risk of abuse or neglect, by every measure. And we had put that on our to-do list. On the first day, I restructured that function. We peeled out just two things that we were very bad at, the protection of children and the related question of child support collection. To me, the most effective anti-poverty program I know of. Every dollar we collect goes straight to the pocket of a single parent who's trying to take care of, of a, a probably a low-income household. And we, we peeled those out and immediately began rebuilding it new training, getting, uh, you know, promoting the best and, and uh, uh, informing the worst workers that they had a little time to improve or else. That system has been winning national awards the last two or three years. We would still be negotiating if those 160 pages were, were still in effect. And the children of Indiana would have been, would have been the victims of that. We, uh, instituted the first possible opportunity, it was the end of our first year, pay for performance in our state. Uh, to you, the most obvious, uh, natural uh, system in the world, in government, radical. But um, once free to do so, we quickly went to bell curve treatment, which has led to the best 6 8% each year of Indiana employees receiving the highest um, pay increases in state history. The very best of the best, we had people get double-digit increases year on year. At the other end of the bell curve, people got zero and a probationary period to improve or else. If we measure everything in state government, being a monopoly, government uh, needs an accountability transplant. In the world in which you live, the world measures you. You do a lousy enough job, you'll lose something that matters, market share, sales, stock price. Government being the last, about the last monopoly we permit in this society, uh, uh, can't go out of business and won't get better on its own unless somebody's measuring and we operate under the business principle. If you're not keeping score, you're just practicing. But the enforcement of the accountability uh, comes ultimately by doing right by the people who get it right and weeding out those people who don't. That would not have been possible ever under the agreements as they stood. The point I want to make to you is that 
Yes, uh, there are questions of equity and fairness and dollars and cents, certainly in some of the most extreme states, those around here for instance, <laughs> involved in, in uh, restoring balance uh, to the uh, performance of public service. But there's something else that I think matters at least as much, and that is the, the efficient, effective, confidence-building delivery of public service. I was just so thrilled. I, didn't, I get here Sunday night, and there's some background information on different events, including this one, and that's the first I knew about the survey work that the Institute has recently commissioned and, and which Stephen made reference to. And there isn't anything that has lifted me up more than that in quite a while. Uh, we've never asked that question. But if, in fact, 77% of my fellow citizens believe their state government is operating effectively, that has to be a huge increase over whatever it would have been a few years ago. And that matters to me. One, it's a matter of duty. I've always believed that those of us committed to limited government have a dual responsibility, and sometimes the second part of it gets short shrift. Question one is, should government be doing this at all? And we've asked that question in case after case after case. We have the fewest state employees Indiana has had since 1976. We have the fewest state employees per capita in the country. We have gotten out of a lot of business that the state had no business being in. But within that sphere, however you might define it, or I might, that sphere of things that government must do, should do, legitimately should do collectively, then um, I think there's a really solemn responsibility to do it as well as possible. And I always say we should never take a tax dollar from a free citizen without a very necessary purpose, but if we do identify that purpose, we have an equally heavy responsibility to spend it as well as possible. And the last point I'll make about this is, and you may see it differently, but I think public confidence in government is important, especially at a moment of national peril like the one we're in now. And many friends of liberty and friends of limited government, I think without thinking enough about it, allow skepticism about big government, which is as American as the Coney dog, to, to become contempt for all government and a disdain and a cynicism that says government can never shoot straight no matter what. I don't think that's in our national interest. I don't think that's the right way to perform public service. When I think about what's ahead of us as a country, the huge change that is necessary to reconstruct and rebuild not just our economy but the whole idea of citizenship, the whole, to validate once again the principle that free peoples can govern themselves effectively, make decisions that are not too short term, that are not too selfish. Um, having public confidence that the people advocating those changes might actually get it done is a good thing, or so says I. So in this book that's come out today, there's a chapter that um, draws heavily on the work of the Institute. I think you're quoted in there a place or two, Stephen, and at least uh, uh, I don't remember plagiarizing it <laughs> intentionally. I called it the great inversion to suggest that we have been through a, a, uh, a, a big change that not enough people had, had noticed, or at least maybe till the last year or two. Some of us were raised to think that public service was, and the public sector, was where people went to uh, uh, be good stewards and to do those things that might enable the flourishing of the important part of life, business, and nonprofits, and voluntary associations, and the protection of personal liberty. There's a different school of thought, of course, which right now has gained the upper hand in many states and in our nation, which I'm sure with the most benevolent of intentions 
believes that life's just too complicated for the average citizen, uh, that they, uh, there are predators all around, and that, and that the I think this one's working. I'll try to talk over him here. Yeah. To uh, believe that, uh, as I say probably too glibly, that too many of our citizens uh, uh, are objects of therapy, not creatures of dignity. And that uh, there are just victims everywhere. And that we need our benevolent betters uh, to make the big decisions of life. What kind of mortgages we can have, what kind of credit cards we can manage, what, how our health care, who can make our health care decisions where our kids go to school, what kind of light bulbs to buy. And this mentality has been fortified by the emergence of uh, the unions which uh, uh, you're discussing in, in this conference, and it's a very important subject. Um, it's bigger, in my judgment, than whether states go broke or not. It's bigger than uh, the, the question of fairness, the people paying, the taxpayers paying for government being out-earned, out-benefited, out-tenured by those uh, public servants uh, who, uh, who once really were underpaid, underprotected. What's really at stake is who's in charge here in this country? Uh, are, do the, are the people to be served or to be, uh, uh, to be shepherded over? So I uh, appreciate so much the ongoing work of the Institute. This particular meeting, which I salute as extraordinarily important and especially at this time, and I uh, uh, welcome your questions about uh, this or topics far afield. Thank you very much. Okay. All right, folks, we're going to do some Q&A, same ground rules. Please identify yourself, your affiliation, make a question, not a statement, and obviously uh, we'll, we'll go around. So if we could start, we'll start with Steve and, and build from there. Uh, I'll, I'll repeat it if not. Governor, you've done the hard work, and one of the things that I hear from people in states like yours all the time is we don't want to be forced to pay to bail out those states or pension funds in municipalities that aren't doing the hard work. Yet they fear that if one of these big funds or states went down, that the, the threat to the system would be such that there would be no choice. I wonder where you come down on that. Are you worried about your own state's fiscal stability if something else happens somewhere else, your ability to borrow, or do you think there's enough of a firewall in what you did that you're not concerned and don't want to see states bailed out or pension, big pension funds bailed out? Mm -hmm. um, I may be underestimating the direct risk you ask about, um, but I, I, I suspect that we'd still be able to operate, we'd still uh, uh, be able to borrow. I used to make jokes up till six or eight months ago. I said, just imagine one of these days, our state could have a higher credit rating than our federal government. <laughs> but now we do. <laughs> um, but that doesn't make me any less um, concerned about exactly the, the, the question you're raising. And it would be the height of unfairness, obviously, you'd expect me to say this, for states that have tried to take care of business, tried to live within their means, um, and done so, then to be uh, either directly or indirectly, their citizens, that's where all the money comes from, um, siphoned off to buffer or bail out those who didn't. It was well written just a few days ago that this latest set of proposals from the administration, from the president, is, um, in many ways, a closet bailout. Um, so um, I'm, I'm hoping that good judgment will prevail and it won't happen, but um, you could imagine a creeping bailout in which there are just successive uh, uh, 
successive doling out of borrowed money to prop up governments that can't afford for the uh, can't afford the superstructure they built. Right back there. And just wait for a microphone, please. Uh, my name is Steve Hockman, recovering lawyer, now mediator. Uh, Governor, I'm a big fan of yours, and I have a question about uh, the use of taxpayer money for subsidies. What What is your view? We, we know a lot, both Democrats and Republicans are saying, oh, well, we have to subsidize, let's say, small businesses or other entities. Uh, or My question is, uh, we all know some small businesses, which is maybe defined by having less than X number of employees, uh, may be owned by very rich people. Would you support a notion that says government money, taxpayer money, whether it be federal, state, local, whatever, should never be used to subsidize anything other than or anything other than a individual needy person, individual. No subsidies to entities or businesses or industries. Wipe them all out. What I'm going to jump in with questioner's prerogative. Where uh, l let's not have an absolute pledge per se, but if you could speak broadly about the yeah. principles of subsidies, I that's think an that important would be great. question. I mean, uh, to do something as sweeping as you're suggesting, Steve, might run into definitional problems that I haven't thought all the way through. You know, what's what's a subsidy and what isn't? But um, you know, you're raising a very important question. We face it all the time. Um, uh, there is nothing quite so dangerous as the power to, uh, in, in a politician's hand, to, uh, as we say, uh, uh, incentivize a business, let's say, to move in, move from state A to state B. Um, it, it's uh, the, the powerful incentive for the politician is to cut the ribbon, be gone when the bills come due. And um, we guard against that very carefully in our state. Another thing I did on that first day I talked about was cashier a state bureaucracy called the Department of Commerce, which, as far as I could tell, wasn't creating any commerce. And we created something different. It's been replicated. I think Scott Walker's most recently done this. A uh, nonprofit corporation. We have real business people working there. Um, and it is their job to go out, and, and they've had a spectacular success, record after record after record year, um, at... Uh, uh, attracting new investment to our state from U.S. and from abroad. But uh, we are very rigorous in policing and, in that, and, the, and, and measuring uh, the uh, incentives they are, that they are giving out. And as I mentioned to you outside, the second slide at the board meeting, we had our quarterly board meeting last week. First slide. How many transactions? How many new jobs? Second slide, how many dollars per job? Their goal was to drive that number down, to play better poker than anybody else. And we fire them if they, we'd fire them if they ever um, missed their mark. And we have brought the, in, in Indiana, I'll tell you just two facts. When we get a shot at an at a investment, our win rate is, approaches 90%. But um, it, is, it is almost constant that some other state is offering higher incentives at the front end. We brought the number of dollars down. These are usually, it's usually um, a temporary period of reduced taxation and maybe some small do training dollars. That's usually the currency we're dealing in, not cash, not some of these other things. It was $36,000 a job. When we got there, it's between eight and 9,000 a day. The goal for the staff is to get it even lower. Why does this happen? Why do we win? Simple, you know, because business people are doing an all-in business case. They're going to make an investment. It's going to be 20 or 30 years if it works. Yeah, they're interested uh, in uh, front-end uh, goodies, but what really drives the decision in the end is what's the, what's the cost going to be over the long term? And if our taxes are lower and our workers' comp is lower and our cost of regulation is lower and our litigation climate is better and our infrastructure is superior, they're going to pick us. And uh, so I would rather leave it to competition. The states that squander their money on this, I think, eventually pay a price. Absolutely. Uh, right up here in the middle table. Uh, Paul Lindhurst, uh, management consultant. Uh, 
the goal, I think, of all these government improvements is to create a climate where the private economy is thriving. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at Indiana, I think a good member of what we affectionately call the Rust Belt, uh, and you compare it to your neighbors uh, in areas of economic growth, inward investment, unemployment, can you see the effect of your policies? This is a fortunate audience in that I didn't bring my slideshow along. Uh, you'd have been barraged with a series of maps that would show you that by no matter who's doing the evaluating these days, there are surveys of chief executives, there are you know, organizations that do indices, there are the people, we pay a lot of attention to the, the people who help companies select sites. Indiana's in the top tier of every one of those lists now. All the maps look about the same. There's a few Sunbelt states and us. You know, occasionally some other state sneaks in there, but it's a very constant pattern. And um, you know, it's no guarantee of success. You can't swim upstream against a terrible national economy like we've got now. I mean, it was very, very frustrating. We were in, such, we were in a boom period in 2008 before the bubble burst. Um, and, and we had come to the fore in all those ratings. And I told people, and then everything stopped. And I told people it, it was like being the prettiest girl in school and they called off the prom. Um, but it has been, your question is, is, is uh, right on the mark because uh, um, that, is the, that is the central purpose around which we have organized our entire public service. I got a group about this size, slightly smaller than this together. They were our first appointees. And this is between the period of election and inauguration in a hotel in Indianapolis. And these are people who had agreed to come in and serve. Almost none had ever been anywhere near government. Our team had been out for 16 years. This turned out to be a big plus, by the way. They were coming from business. Some were retired. Some were you know, coming from uh, some other walk of life. But, um, and I said to them, uh, as I've said many times since, look, every great endeavor, every great enterprise I ever saw had a very clear purpose. Um, pick your buzzword. It was their strategic objective. It was their mission. You know, and uh, and everybody in the organization knew what it was. It was on the wall. It was on the annual report. It was on the laminated ID card. It was, it was in the air. And then, every everybody in the organization knew what their role was in delivering that objective. Okay, and here's ours. We're here to raise the net disposable income of Hoosiers, which has been sinking for 40 years. And so that means I don't care where you're working. I don't care how remote you think you are from the, from the business of, of business. We're going to be asking you, as you take office, what can you do in your group can, uh, do or do better or do faster or quite possibly stop doing that makes it more likely the next job and the next investment happens here. And we're going to measure that. And we're going to reward you if you do a good job and vice versa. It's pretty simple. And then we're going to run the business of the state, the people's business, as efficiently as we can so that the, uh, we leave more of the dollars that are earned in the pockets of those who earn them. That's it. And everything we've done since relates to that goal. We have a question up at the front table. Josh? Thanks, uh, Governor Daniels. I'm Josh Barrow with Manhattan oh, yeah. Institute. Good yeah. to see you. Um, uh, when we heard from Governor uh, Scott Walker this morning, he focused a lot on the interaction between state government and local government in Wisconsin. A lot of their reforms were focused not just on the state workforce, but on achieving savings at the local level. And you've done a, a tremendous amount of innovative work in the state workforce and in state agencies. What's the status of, of local government in Indiana? And is there a lot of low-hanging fruit to be had by taking the state-level innovations down to the local level? There is. Making that transfer, Josh, will not be an easy thing. We have a archaic system of government. One of the, there a lot of things we've done we feel fulfilled about. One thing that's not worked, not done well at all, is our attempt to, to modernize, rationalize local government. We have way too many levels, uh, way too many offices, way too many politicians. Made a little headway, but not enough. And so yeah, we, we've worked on this. I mean, we have offered, for instance, we've rationalized procurement in the state. We get the best deals by far the state's ever gotten. Did what a good business does. I mean, I, decentralization, has, pressing down decision making has a lot of value in business, but there are certain functions I learned where dictatorship works best. IT's one, or everybody goes and orders their own, you know, toy. Uh, procurement's another. 
All right, we've offered the local governments and school districts of the state, buy on our schedule. You know, a lot better deal than you probably are. It's starting to happen. But you know, you can, on you can only do so much when you don't, you can't really call the shots. The single most effective thing we may have done to try to bring some uh, improved uh, efficiency to local government was cap property taxes. We cut them by a third. Um, basically, we picked up off the local property tax levy about a third of what they were doing, brought it to the state level where we can control it ourselves, and then with regard to the two-thirds that was left, we put a we, we ended their ability to just dial up taxes to match spending. And so there had been a lot of hand-wringing, but as a matter of fact, there was low-hanging fruit. And the proof is that even in a recession, no, but nobody's gone belly up out there. They're doing the things they should have done a long time ago. Necessity was the mother. But if there's a better answer than that, I haven't found it yet. Right up here. Here you go to your other side. Uh, Tom McArdle with Investors Business Daily. Mm -hmm. As a governor and having served as OMB director, you must have a unique perspective on why the federal stimulus has failed, um, contrary to the uh, expectations of its advocates. I'd like to get your thoughts. All right. That. Well, it doesn't have much to do with being a governor. It doesn't have much to do with uh, the, <clears throat> the sentence I served in the federal government. Simon, uh, it was Simon, right? Tom, Tom sorry. Um, you look like it could be a Simon. Yeah. Um, I'll just, but I'll, I'll just give the, the same answer I would have given if you'd asked me when I was uh, still in business or just, uh, um, no, I think it was fated to fail it's, it, because it's fatally flawed in its concept. You know, the whole idea, it, it, I think, History is discredited over and over. You can borrow a lot of money and spend it on government. Whatever the multiplier is, it's probably negative. And in the meantime, it's at war with the goal of, of growing the private economy. And so I, I want to say, though, Tom, um, this is, at the outset of this administration, I, for one, I mean, when people would ask, I didn't criticize uh, uh, those actions that were taken. Um, there was an emergency, and I didn't, so I didn't criticize the, because I didn't have a better idea, and the situation, let's all agree, was very, very fluid. Been in two White Houses, and you know, you, you don't, you, you, sometimes you just have to act and hope you're close to the mark. I didn't even criticize, although I had misgivings, the fiscal component of that. Now, what we thought was coming and what finally came out were two different things, and I think very ill-advised, and therefore I, I can't understand why they keep repeating the same or trying to repeat the same mistakes. But um, you know what what it became, as we discussed a minute ago, is more or less a bailout of, of governments. Mm -hmm. Only a small fraction, for instance, was uh, even committed to public infrastructure. And then when some of us said, "If you're going to do that, you want the money spent soon, throw out the rule book, give us some." Flexibility, and they didn't do that either, which is why 40% of that original money is still unspent. So, um, first time around, give it a try. Round two, round three, we should be doing something different. Governor, I'd like to quickly jump in with a question. Yeah. This morning, uh, as we went through this polling data with uh, Doug Schoen, we saw plenty of evidence that the American public nationally uh, in your state and in the other states we polled, uh, thinks that collective bargaining should broadly be tinkered with or reformed a bit. But they do not see the connection between reforming that process and making state budgets more resilient. Mm -hmm. uh, if we look to other governors, not yourself and Scott Walker, who, are, who have gone and are go going through it, what would you advise them if they take on this fight? How do they frame this conversation? Oh, first, I think in terms of, of, of basic fairness, that the tax that, 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 that those who are privileged to work for government, it is a privilege, ought, ought not be um, um, advantaged way beyond what the, those paying their salaries are experiencing. I think that's a, a matter of fairness that most people, at least once they hear the facts, if they haven't already, you know, can relate to. Um, 
As I suggested earlier, there's, a, I think, a very powerful argument to be made that if you want government to work better, um, you need to give those you're holding responsible the authority, the flexibility to do that. And, um, um, but I don't know that I have a, a magic answer for you. Those, those, those are the arguments I would make if we were doing it today. And then I'd say, and incidentally, we'll save a lot of money. I think that's a key insight that uh, we, we haven't heard this morning. We have time for about two more questions. The governor's been very gracious. If we could come here to the center table. Yeah, hey, Bill. One second, Bill. There you go. Uh, Bill McGurn from News Corporation. Governor, to follow up on the question there uh, before about your neighbors, it seems that right now in the Midwest we have a giant experiment in addressing some of the common problems we mm -hmm. have with the public sector and so forth. And as you mentioned, by all measures, you've been the most successful. Um, what I'm wondering is why, um, why are some states, it seems like Illinois, you're your nearby neighbor has not learned anything from your example. I'm curious what the reasons for that are. And second, I'm wondering, are the other states, are some of the other Republican governors, are they sending people to Indiana to see what you did right? You know, rather than reinvent the wheel, are they looking at what you've done? I mean, are you affecting the other states around you? Well, Bill, that, that question would be best put to others. I can tell you, we've had many, many um, visitors and many, many uh, questions. I've spent a lot of time personally with some of this wonderful new group of um, uh, this talented new group that's come to office recently. Um, another thing, I mean, we've been cherry picked to death by people. The, the elections were barely over, literally, when our folks started getting calls. Many of them got hired away uh, to other states, which uh, we weren't happy to see, but I guess that's if they will take it as a compliment. And, and I hope they'll, they can do some good for these other places. You know, on the subject of Illinois, I always have to be careful here. <laughs> First of all, don't ask me to explain Illinois to you any, I can, any more than I could explain New York to somebody back home. I don't know. Uh, but, um, you know, they're handy to have next door is all I can tell you. They, uh, what was it, you know? Uh, I don't know. Louisiana used to say, thank goodness for Mississippi. Well... <laughs> We're in a little bit the same, in the same place. Um, but you know, a beauty we all know of our, of our federal system is it's, it's built in capacity for self-correction. And um, you know, the, the states uh, uh, in the, uh, I love the way, the roost belt, you said I love that, uh, so-called. Just think back just a little bit now. Uh, very interesting from our standpoint. Uh, per permit a quick bit of history. Uh, as I said, our team had been out for 16 long years in Indiana, and most of that time we were surrounded by states that I thought were getting it more right than we were. And you had some pretty enlightened people. You had governors like John Engler in Michigan and Edgar in Illinois. You had Tommy Thompson in Wisconsin and so forth. Well, there's a rhythm in politics, and eventually, you know, the other side in our state wore out their welcome to the, ex to the extent that a guy like me could break through. And those other states went the other direction. But now, I think people in Michigan, people in Ohio, people in Wisconsin, everywhere but Illinois, basically, Iowa, you know, looked at the results and said, not good enough. Try something different. And now they're getting something very different. So, you know, I think that if, if things are tough enough, long enough in Illinois, uh, folks will look for something different. And, and um, it's a real strength of the, of the system that we have that they get a chance to do that. All right, the final question of the afternoon. It's coming behind you. Julie Killian, New Yorkers for Growth. Um, I lived in South Bend for four years, and I'm wondering if you have seen improvements across your state um, and thinking of an inner city like South Bend or Fort Wayne. We've seen improvements, but not everywhere, Julie. And um, um, uh, progress is as uneven within a state our size as it is across the, the country, place to place. Uh, local, uh, you know, Scott Walker would have probably made this point, local leadership matters. There are places, we, we've had, as I say, a, a, a pretty good run 
and attracting more than our share of what new investment is out there. Um, but uh, ultimately, they have to pick a place. And there are some that where uh, they get a look around, they say, hmm, what else you got? Uh, so um, South Bend's about to have a new uh, uh, mayor, and uh, maybe he'll have a new uh, outlook. They've struggled. I can't tell you we've had the, the kind of success we really want to have there, but uh, I can tell you there are a lot of other places that are doing tremendously, and just as maybe Illinois will look around and want to modify their behavior, I, I'm hoping that within our state, those, those, and I'll say few, communities that still uh, are too slow, that still are too expensive by their own actions, that still sometimes are too hostile to business, will uh, get a new attitude. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think the governor has been very gracious with his time. If you haven't noticed, he's a remarkably humble man, but I will say, having read his book, and you said before I'm a partisan or a, a biased audience, uh, and that's why I'm saying this, but it is truly a unique political book in that it is not a rehashing of Governor Daniel's time in office. It is much more a thoughtful, philosophical book about a vision for America, peppered in with examples from his state and other states. And that's why we wanted you to be here today, and that's why we're proud to have it. So I commend that book to you, and let's thank the governor. I think it is clear how fortunate we are to believe in the power of ideas. Supply the common sense and the fresh thinking to the Manhattan Institute.